What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast, Real Estate Tip. And today I'm here to talk to you about real estate teams. And we're going to be doing a, a deep dive breakdown here when it comes to real estate teams. We're going to be discussing why you should consider starting a real estate team. When do you know that you're ready to start your team? How to identify the best model to grow your team under? Um, different comp plans, split structures, and how to identify the best comp plan and split structures. How to continue to grow and scale your team. And other important important critical shit that's just essential to know when it comes to creating and continuing to grow and scale a successful real estate team. So again, doing a deep dive here into everything when it comes to teams and real estate teams. Now, before we jump into this, if you haven't already, make sure to go check out gsdmode.com for a bunch of additional free training, free resources on there. You got my free ebook on there that I highly recommend to go out there and snag and grab, which are 42 top strategies, top tips that have allowed me to become one of the top agents and team leaders on the planet. Each chapter is a different tip. There's no fluff inside there. You know, get right to the point nothing being sold. It's hundred percent free on. There's also my uh, free masterclass, which is a three hour in-depth online training on six steps to three X your real estate business, regardless of the marketplace. So whether we're experiencing a boom, a bust, crash, anything in between, how to continue to grow and scale your business each and every single year and even three X or more your business, regardless of the marketplace. So that's available. That's on there. At least for, I mean, it's only going to be on there for a limited amount of time here. We're going to be uh, 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 you know, swapping out that training here shortly. Um, but on there also, I highly recommend that you check out my coaching program. So you can see that coaching tab or you can go to gsdmode.com forward slash coaching. So look, if you are an individual agent, team leader or brokerage owner and you are looking and you are committed to growing and scaling your business and you are looking for the right guidance, the right mentor, the right coach to help you go out there and do that, I highly recommend again that you check out my personal mentorship, my personal coaching program, which is hands down the most effective far superior coaching program that exists in the industry. I'm the guy everybody goes to when they've you know hired all the other coaches out there realize that they've failed them and they're looking to go out there and build a truly successful business. I'm the guy that people go to when they are serious about getting truly dialed in when it comes to growing and scaling their business. Not only is it the far uh, uh, most superior and effective coaching program that exists in our industry, it's also hands down the most affordable. So if you are looking for the most effective and affordable coaching program that exists in our industry to help you go out there and accomplish and make your real estate goals a reality, highly recommend that you go check out my mastery bootcamp coaching program. Again, gsdmode.com forward slash coaching. All right, enough with that. Let's just jump on to the content at hand. And again, we are here to talk about real estate teams. We're going to talk about why you should consider starting a real estate team, when you know that you're ready to start your real estate team, um, how to identify that best model, comp plans, split structures, continue growth and scale, all of that. We're going to cover all of that here. Now, let's first start off with um, why you should consider starting a real estate team. Now, you already might know that you want a team and have a team, you know, and so forth. Um, but for those of you that are maybe on the fence of this, um, you know, and don't know if this is right for you, here's why. And even if you already have a team and you already know that this is right for you, this will still be impor important for you to understand. Look, if you are an individual agent, um, and 97% of those in this industry are individual agents and, and will, will maintain and remain individual agents for the rest of their career. 97% of this industry never start a team, never join a team, never, you know, have a team, create a team. They remain and maintain individual agents for the rest of their entire, their whole entire careers. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's the path for you or the path for them, okay, that's fine. There's no right or wrong. It's just what's right for you. But you need to understand, and this is really important to know and understand, is that you are then always going to be subject to having a capacity. So think of a capacity as a glass ceiling, right? And then so you're going to, boom, you're going to hit this glass ceiling. And no matter what you do to optimize your business, no matter how dialed in you get your skill sets, no matter how dialed in you get your processes, your systems, no matter how hard you work, eventually boom, you are going to hit that glass ceiling. There's only so many hours a day and only so much that you can do. And that capacity is going to be different for everybody. So it's highly dependent, again, on, on what your skill set is and how good you are with dialing in your processes and systems, which allow for effectiveness and efficiency. You know, so, um, you know, if somebody, you know, um, so again, depending on those things, that might be 30 deals a year might be 40 deals a year, might be 50 deals a year, might be 60 deals a year. It's going to be different for everybody, depending on those things I already talked about. Um, but eventually, boom, we are going to run in and hit that glass ceiling and hit that capacity. So if you want to be able to continue to grow and scale your real estate business, so you can continue to make more and more income and more and more money in this industry, and also at the same time, eventually be able to have some element of life, the only way to do that is to go out there and create a real estate team. Now, when I say team, because you might be like, oh, shit, well, I can go out there and create a brokerage. When I say team here, just for definition's sake, I'm talking about more than one. 
right? So a team, you know, the way that it's traditionally looked at in this business, team versus a brokerage, right? Like it's just all the same shit. There's very little difference. And from a fundamental standpoint, they're exactly the same thing, right? So what I'm talking about here when I say the word team is more than one, right? So, okay, like you're either a solo agent or you're going out there and bringing on another human being, which now you've teamed up together. Doesn't mean a business partnership can be an employee relationship, but you've teamed up together, you know, right? Where now you have more than one people, you know, working on your business to increase your capacity, to increase your overall production, increase your overall flow. That's what I mean by team. You know, I'll hear, you know, some in our industry are like, oh yeah, well, I'm an individual agent and, you know, they're maybe doing 100, 200 deals a year. And then, you know, come to find out they have five, uh, five admin. That is a team. If you are, yeah, you, you're true. Like that might be true. Like you're the only agent that is listed on the contracts, right? Um, but when you got, you know, five admin, that means you are a team of six, you know, right? And again, I'm not, I mean, in, industries can define this different. Award systems can define this different. This is how I'm defining it for the sakes of this podcast right here. So we are all on the same page. So by team, I'm talking about more than one. Eventually, you are going to need people to go out there and delegate out certain tasks too, right? And at, at the core, when it comes to building a business at the highest level, your job is to always be firing yourself, right? But you got to be very strategic with this. You got to know when to fire yourself at what, what positions, at what time. Got to make sure that you are financially and fiscally responsible when you're doing this. But it's, a, you know, you fire yourself in this position that allows you to then allocate your time to the next best and highest resource of your time. So again, if you want to go continue to be able to grow and scale your business and grow and scale your income so you can continue to make more and more money while at the same point, eventually being able to have a life in this business, the only way to do that is to go out there and delegate and build a team. Okay, so that's why you might want to consider this and why I think everybody should consider this, right? And, and I know that there's a lot of limiting beliefs or a lot of thoughts out there and a lot of negativity when it comes to building a team because the failure rate is so high from team leaders. You know, actually the failure rate of team leaders is higher than the failure rate of individual agents. And then when I say by that is, you know, I know individual agents that are failing or dropping out of the business. What I mean by team leaders that are failing um, is they go start this team and they set out to start this team. Um, but then because of the resistance that they experience and the headaches that they experience, boom, they retract back to just being an individual agent and say, screw this, fuck this. Like you want something done right. You got to go out there and do it yourself. You know, um, side note, when I hear anybody say that, all that means is they have shitty processes and shitty systems. They, they, they're, they're that, that resistance is being experienced um, because of a lack of strategy and a lack of systems and a lack of processes, all things that we're going to break down here in this podcast today. Um, um, but um, you know, don't allow, that to prohibit you from moving forward. Oh man, well, you know, so and so over here, I saw what they went through. Look, dude, if they had if they struggled in that manner, and I'm not saying it doesn't come without struggle. Everything comes with 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 there, you know, not, nothing's easy. Everything has its different challenges. But there's much more strategic ways to go out there and deploy this. And if you do this right, you know, most people go out there and start a team just because they're busy. You know, they, they understand they need to delegate things, but they don't go out there and study it. They don't research it. They're shooting from the hip. They have no strategy. And of course, if you just go out there and fucking, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, approach anything. If I go try to do an open house and I have no idea what I'm doing beforehand, yeah, I'm probably going to get a shitty result. You know, right? So as long as you are prepared and understand what you are doing and, and you, you know that going into this, look, you can have massive success with this. And I can also just tell you from experience it's easier, the bigger your team gets, the easier it gets, you know, right? Um, um, uh, and, and that'll be something that, you know, you can, you, you'll experience later down the road. I don't want to get into that right now. Um, so that's why you should consider starting a team. All right, so then from there, when do you know that you are ready to start your team? Now, just a side note here, it's really important. You should always hire admin before agents, admin before agents. I yet, I've yet to meet one team leader or one brokerage owner that went out there and started recruiting agents before they had at least one rockstar admin in place that didn't learn to, uh, didn't live to regret that decision. Look, if you start high bringing in on agents and recruiting agents before you have at least one rockstar admin in place, you are quickly going to become that admin. It's going to bog down your business and you are going to experience a lot of resistance and a lot of pain and a lot of headaches. And it's going to be a mistake that you are going to massively regret. So just take my word on that. I'm not going to go deeper into that on this, but I want you to have that understanding. Now, luckily, I didn't make that mistake. Luckily, you know, I, I did 40 deals my first year. At that point, hit my capacity, decided to hire my first assistant, right? Brought me to 103 the next and, and you know, so forth and started adding agents and so forth at that point, you know, after I brought on that admin. Uh, but I went out there and I researched this. I studied this. I, I you know, was, I had a proficiency and knowledge on team growth, even though it was new to me, 
I went out there and learned from others, you know, right. Um, and that's what you're doing here on this podcast, you know, um, and, and I can walk you through a lot of, a lot of learning uh, curves and learning experiences after running and operating a team for 17 plus years now. All right. So with that being said, okay. So if we're talking about hiring it, at least one rockstar admin first, what I recommend as far as when you know you are ready is you want to make sure that you are, you're hiring or you're growing your team out of necessity, not out of want. Nothing wrong with wanting to start a team. I think everybody should want to start a team, right? Like I think everybody deserves to go out there and make more and more money and also have a life and be able to enjoy life in this business. And again, the only way to do that is to have a, have a team. So I highly recommend everybody go out there and start a team, but starting out of want isn't enough. You need a, you need a, it needs to be necessary. So step number one is make sure that you are at or close to a capacity. You've got to have enough business for that person to be able to take on that work. Otherwise, you're going to create another job for yourself, just trying to hunt and think of shit for them to do. And it's going to bog you down that much further. It's a trap I see people fall in all the time, you know, when it comes to hiring. The other brilliant part about a capacity um, is when you get to that capacity. Okay, so here's an example. I did 48 deals my first year before I hired my first admin. I was 48 closings from A to Z, you know, and, and every phase of that, from the lead gen, the lead follow-up to appointment conductions to you know, contract to close to I mean everything of that. Yeah, you know, I did all of those flying solo. So I was able then to understand and start building out and defining what those perfect processes should be. So when I hired, let's just say a transaction coordinator, well, I had enough repetitions and enough experience to then know and break down and build out the exact contract to close experience that I needed my assistant to go out there and follow and to make sure that my clients had the, the you know great the, that great experience and things got done and done right and done on time look when you are going out there and hiring anybody inside your organization especially on the admin side you know agents maybe they have some freedom to go out there and do their own things and we'll talk about that more as we get into these different models but especially on the admin side you know, um, my admin aren't doing anything different than what I'd be doing. They're just doing it instead of me. So when I hire a transaction coordinator, they're just deploying and following the same exact contract to close process from A to Z that I would be doing. They're just doing it instead of me, right? So when you get to that capacity, well, then at that point, usually you've had enough repetitions to be able to define those processes and so forth. So you want to be at that capacity. And then secondary, you want to be, fis you do this fiscally responsible and be financially ready. So let's just say you're bringing on, you know, this full-time rockstar admin. And look, I know there's a lot of different ways that you can do this, so, you know, VAs versus, you know, in-house and neither one's, you know, I, I'm not buying towards either one that can all be great so it might be anywhere between five bucks an hour to 20 bucks an hour whether you're going va or in-house for for a good admin um to help with you know all the essential non-money making activities inside your business um but let's just say it's an in-house admin not a va and let's just say you know for for just easy sake for this podcast let's just say okay you're paying them a three thousand dollar month salary I'm not saying to go out there and do that right uh, go out there and know what that going rate is in your marketplace and depending on their skill set and talent that can decipher and differ and, and so forth but let's just say for you know argument's sake of this podcast here you're, you're paying a three thousand dollar month salary well, your hard costs are going to be more than three thousand dollars a month. You got payroll tax, you got unemployment tax, you got Social Security tax. You know, um, if you have to offer benefits or if you're choosing to offer benefits, you know, you got those costs. So that three thousand dollars a month person might actually cost you thirty five hundred a month or four thousand dollars a month, right? So know what those true costs are. Then from there, okay, like that good admin, it's going to take about ninety days to get that person fully trained, fully onboarded, rocking and rolling. Where then, boom, now that person's bought you back that forty hours a week. Where now I can go invest that forty hours a week into money making activities inside my business right so that first 90 days like i'm having to maintain my current business plus training them and it's hard to maintain your business as you're training and onboarding at least that especially that first admin until you have other admin that eventually like when you have rockstar admin and you start adding other admin well your rockstar admin can train the new admin so you know but this is infancy stages here right we're talking about when you know you're ready to start your team so it's different like what, when i hire people today it's different than when i did when i first my first hire my first hire like i who had i had to train them you know right that was a part of my role um okay so let's just say it's nine days before i buy that time back right so i have 90 days now of no i got this added expense but no increase in income um then now we know that what we do today, we probably aren't going to see the fruits of that labor for 90 to 120 days in this business. Okay, so now after 90 days, now I bought back my 40 hours a week where I can go focus, for, uh, focus 40 more hours a week on money making activities. You know, um, but again, I'm not seeing that uptick of income for another 90 or 120 days. Now we're talking six to seven months. So now I got this $3,500 monthly added expense inside my business month after month for the next six to seven months before I start to see an uptick in income. Can I afford to do that? Right. Am I in a position now? The great thing about getting to a capacity first, 
right? Is usually then you have the income there. So usually if you, if you, you know, uh, 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 hiring out of necessity, not out of want, usually that income is going to be there, but make sure that it is there. It's like when I hired my first assistant after splits, fees, costs, whatever, and all my expenses and, and business, I was making about $25,000 a month net on all of that. My personal expenses were about $5,000 a month, you know, so then, okay, I had enough leftover business disposable income to easily bring on that, that admin, um, and not have those stressors. I could do it and give it the time to really get them dialed in and so forth. Like you don't want to run out of money, you know, before before that ROI comes in. You know, so like think of it like when you hire an admin, it's no different than, okay, if I'm going to go out there and, you know, start doing, let's just say direct mail. Okay, well, if I'm doing direct mail on a geo farm area, well, I got a budget and have that understanding. That's probably going to be six, nine, 12 months before I start receiving an ROI. You know, so I got to make sure I have the income and the budget for that so I can stick with it long enough to get those results, right? So, you know, whether you're investing in marketing or investing in people, it's kind of that same strategy with that. So again, make sure that capacity and then make sure that you are financially ready when it comes to going out there and starting your team. But again, get that rockstar admin in place to get your non-money-making activities off of your plate, your essential non-money-making activities. What are your money-making activities? Just in case you don't know what those are. So as an agent, at, at least at this stage of the game, it's going to be setting appointments, conducting appointments, negotiating contracts, right? And there's going to be things that go into each of those, like setting appointments going to be your lead gen lead follow-up, right? The, uh, conducting appointments, okay, I got to prep for my listing presentation, buyer presentation, I got to uh, conduct those, you know, and so forth. Negotiate any contracts also includes like showing homes because I got to show homes to find the home to negotiate the contract, right? But anything that has to do with those three things, setting appointments, conducting appointments, negotiating contracts, those are my money making activities. Those are going to be my responsibilities. Anything that has to do with those are my responsibilities. Everything else, essential non-money making activities, I'm going to make a list of all of those things that take place in my business. And then boom, I'm going to hand those off to that first full-time uh, rockstar admin. You know, that'll get me to that next capacity. Then from there, you know, right, dependent on, the model that you identify is going to then decipher what that next hire is. So now let's transition into how to decide what model is right for you. Now you can go the traditional team model route, right? Which is what typically most of us think about when we think of a real estate team, you know, which is going to be heavier agent side. And, and so you're going to have more agents than you do admin. The amount of admin that you have um, is really going to be dependent on how good your systems and processes are, how what your skill set is in identifying great talent out there. You know, so it's going, you know, and, and again, so how the talent that you hire along with your systems and process and how dialed in those are will then depend, you know, depend upon their efficiency, effectiveness, and so forth. You know, the better those are, the higher that capacity. You know, so again, like I, my transaction coordinators on my team, you know, they can handle about 30 closings per month, which before they're out of capacity. So that may mean that each transaction coordinator is working and handling 75 active files at any time. You know, so their capacity is higher, you know, because we have dialed in processes and systems and, you know, um, um, uh, and I know how to go out there and hire talent and, and get great people that, that you know, like don't fuck around and, and, and work and, and, you know, get a lot of production and productivity out of them. You know, um, because I'll get asked, and the reason why I bring this up is I get asked sometimes, uh, well, what's the perfect ratio? Is it like one admin to 10 agents, one admin to 20 agents? What's that perfect ratio? I'm like the ratio again, it's all dependent on your skill set of hiring, you know, how uh, skill set of hiring talent, your systems and your processes, which all come down to your skill sets of building those things and deploying those things inside your business to increase that efficiency. But regardless, a traditional team is usually going to be more, you know, heavier agents. You know, you might have you know two or three admin and have you know. 30 agents, right? Um, uh, whatever that may be um, inside that. And then with the traditional teams, you know, a lot of traditional teams or, you know, team leaders, you're providing, you know, not just support staff, so like transaction coordination, listing coordination, but you're providing all the equipment, all of the systems, you know, it's like signposts, lockboxes, you know, yard signs, open house signs, you're providing a website, you're providing a CRM. So you're providing all of that stuff. So you're providing all of the equipment, all of the systems, all of the support, and a lot for a lot, you're providing leads. Now you don't have to, and we'll talk about leads given and non-leads given models because you don't have to, you know, but typically what, what's thought of as a traditional team, just because it's most popular, is in that they're also giving leads, you know, and it might be like a 50-50 split and so forth. Okay, well, that's one model that you can go after. And again, I'm just kind of going, we're not doing an extreme deep dive into these different models, but that's one model. And the pro of that model um, is it's proven. Um, pro of that model is it's 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 scalable, not as scalable as a non-leads given model, but it's it's scalable. Um, and you know the margins can be decent, you know if if it's done right and it's easy to be managed. Um, now another model, another alternative to that. Now this this secondary model that I'm going to show with you, this is probably um, uh, I would say the highest 
profit margin model that I've seen inside this industry. Through my experience that I've seen in this industry, I coach a lot and mentor a lot that adopt this model. And there's no right or wrong. There's no best model. It's about what's best for you. And I'll go through a little bit of what my model is today for my own team um, and give you my rhyme to reason with that. But it doesn't mean that my model is going to be the best model for you. Again, there's no right or wrong. Um, now, this next model here um, is, is you know what I call the agent admin boots on the ground model you know um so with this let's just say okay and just to you know simplify this let's just say you are the you are the primary agent right so you're going to be out there you're going to be conducting it so you're going to set the appointments you're going to conduct the appointments so then from there you is the the lead agent inside your your real estate team then from there okay you got a rock star admin that's maybe doing listing coordination contract to close you know that's doing all the essential non-money making activities there then your secondary admin so you got that, you know, so that that's your, you know, you got you as the agent, you got your, you know, support admin, then you have your licensed boots on the ground admin, right? So licensed boots on the ground admin, now they'd be licensed agents, but you're paying them, you know, as a full-time employee. So they're not going out there and selling, you know, properties and doing deals, their job and their responsibility inside your organization is to go out there and work, you know, whatever they're 40 hours a week for you um, to do anything that is required in the field. Right. And the reason why they need a license for this is, OK, when you're going in, going out there and showing properties, you know, the reason why I call this a license boots on the ground admin is because it's not just a showing agent. You know, a lot of people go out there and have showing agents, which that might be a big percentage of this person's role, you know, right. Um, but they're going out there, you know, showing all the properties, but then think of anything else that's boots on the ground. You know, OK, well, uh, uh, letting in a photographer into one of your listings, if a photographer needs access, letting an appraiser, letting in a home inspector, you know, doing final walkthroughs. Right. So anything that requires um, access to any of those properties or anything that needs to be delivered, paperwork needs to be picked up, you know, whatever. I can have that ad, that licensed admin boots on the ground person going out there and doing those. And comp structures on these can differ. And I know some that pay, you know, um, uh, per closing, like maybe a thousand dollar flat fee per closing, or maybe pay a percentage of the commission per closing. Um, you know, some that pay, you know, hourly, like 20 bucks an hour for this position, you know, or salary, sometimes a combination of both. You know, I coach and mentor a lot, a, a, a lot of teams that run and operate this model. And all of them have different, you know, different structures for different reasons, you know, and so forth. So again, there's a lot of different ways to go out there and, and split the pay and, and, and the structure with that. Um, but again, this is like, so if you have, this increases your capacity. This is one of the best ways to, if you're looking to increase your own personal capacity and run a very high margin business, like this is a great model. Um, so, so, cause then there's a couple of reasons why I love this model, right? Um, number one, it allows you to scale the buy side of the business every much as the list side, you know? So like, you know, back in the day, there's, you know, been this, you know, thought process of, you know, oh, well, if you want to be a, you know, mega agent or a big agent, you got a list to last and, you know, listings, leads, leverage, book written about it. And that, you know, it was just always a thought process. So I want to become, you know, like, oh, the best agents, the top agents out there, they're heavy on the listing side. And that there, there was a time and you know place where where I would say okay there was a truth to that. Now to that's utter and absolute bullshit. Like with especially with this model right now. Okay, I can scale the buy side every bit as much as I can the list side. You know, because me as the lead agent, all I'm doing is going out there and conducting that appointment. You know, getting them to sign a buyer broker agreement, making sure that they're ready, ready, willing, able, qualified, committed. Then from there, bam! Now I've hand them off to my boots on the ground licensed assistant that's doing all the time consuming home showings and showing all the properties and so forth. Once they identify the property, then it hands back to me. I negotiate the deal, put the deal together. So just like in a listing where you're, you know, conducting the listing presentation negotiating the offers, it then flips the buy side to be every bit as effective or every bit as efficient as that. You know, so now I can go out there and you know do six buyer consults in one single day under this model, right? Is in plus you know listing presentations as well. You know, um, but increases your own personal capacity. The other component that I love uh, with this is it gives autonomy of location. You know, so uh, most of the teams that I coach and mentor at a high level that are running this model, you know, they love to travel. Travel is a big part of their life. You know, there, there's two team leader, two separate team leaders that, that I coach. Um, uh, and just use this as an example. I mean, there's, uh, you know, that's about 705 coaching clients right now. But, you know, of these two that I'm, I'm giving this example on, you know, um, <clears throat> they travel more than both of them separately in their different locations and so forth. Um, but they, they travel about 50% of the time. Like they're, they're gone, you know, whether it be Greece or Japan or Thailand, like they're just all over the place. But this model allows them 
Because especially like in those instances, okay, well, we've constructed, you know, how to go out there and do those buyer consultations and listing presentations all via Zoom. But because of this infrastructure, <clears throat> it makes it where they can have autonomy location because they have the boots on the ground people here. So they can be anywhere. Their, their, their business office can be a hotel room anywhere across the planet. So they can go out there and work and play all throughout the year. And, you know, so it gives that autonomy of, of, of schedule and location. And again, it can be very scalable too, because you don't always need to maintain, you know, being that lead agent. Okay, well, eventually you can then bring somebody else in and teach them how to do the buyer consultations, the listing consultations, negotiate those contracts, you know, and have split structures, you know, in that. So you can also go out there and scale this model as well. So that's another model to go out there and consider. You know, then I have written down here, <clears throat> sorry, I take a little swig. Throat's getting a little dry. Um, then I have in here an ISA model. Now, the ISA model isn't necessarily a unique and different model all on its own. The ISA model, or with an ISA, you can add that model to any of these. So the ISA is just you know that person that's out there instead of you as the team leader or or your agents having to go out there, you know, follow up with these leads and set these appointments. Okay, you can bring somebody in, you know, to go out there and do that. You know, right? Um. So in that, like, is an example, I could plug an ISA into that that you know, um, uh, uh, agent admin boots on the ground model that I just talked about. So then from there, now I have somebody setting the appointments for me. Now I now I'm just conducting the appointments, and negotiating contracts, right? So again, you can start plugging these people in strategically. So if I were to grow that model, you know, okay, I first start off, you know, get to a capacity, then I'd hire my rock star admin to take my essential non money making activities off of my plate, you know, um, inside my business. So like that admin, like just think of it this way, like that admin would do all the essential shit, but never leave the office. Right. So, OK, that would take me to the next capacity. Then the next hire that I would make would be that licensed boots on the ground to take away all that busy, essential busy work that boots on the ground. That takes me to that next capacity. Then from there, if I was going to bring an ISA, then I would strategically bring in the ISA at that point. That's kind of the way I would go out there and structure that model. OK, so then from there, we got a leads given model. Right. And, and, and any of you like, OK, let's just say the traditional team, like you don't need to. Um, um, go out there and offer leads. You don't have to give leads, you know, but you can, you know, typically like on a traditional team, if they're giving leads, like typical splits are 50, 50, you know, if you have an ISA, maybe you're, you're, you're collecting 60%, your agents are getting 40%, or maybe you're getting 70%, they're getting 30%, you know, cause you're, you're the more value that you offer, the more that you bring, right. That's going to then determine what the splits are and comp plans and so forth to ensure profitability as well. And everybody wins, which we'll get into here later. And in, in the next step, as I'm going to talk about splits and comp plans, um, you know, but what I don't want you to think is that, hey, man, I've got to give leads. Like you can go out there and give leads if you want to go out there and give leads. You know, um, benefit is, OK, you can get higher splits if you're giving leads and you can have more people working those leads, you know, um, um, you know, with that. Uh, but there's also some negatives to that. You know, you got to Mike, you got to have a management process of those. You got to have a quality control process. You got to make sure that your agents aren't, you know, that, that your agents are on those or working those or your ISAs are working those. Right. So, you know, it's, it's another added thing that you need to monitor that you got to make sure that you QC and get dialed in. You know, like in my leads given division. Okay. I got to make sure that my agents are following the exact follow-up protocol in order to continue getting those leads. You know, I got to QC their trackers daily. I got to QC their CRMs daily. And then I got to make sure that they are a 20% appointment set to closing ratio for me to go out there and get the ROI that I need and want. Right. And again, that can be effective. It can be highly profitable. It can be all of those things, but it's another thing that needs to be managed and managed well and done right. You know, um, but you can build a team where you don't give leads, you know, right? So I also have a division and, and actually most of my agents on my team don't get leads from me. You know, right now I provide everything else that you would think of in a traditional team. I provide all the support. I provide all the equipment, all of the systems, all the coaching, training, mentorship, all the guidance. Everything is there except leads. You know, right. Um, and then it's a different split, you know, for those agents, you know, that aren't getting those leads because they're self-procuring those deals. So I give them a little bit more of a lucrative split, you know, um, but that so if you're like, man, I don't want to screw with the, you know, the whole lead concept and I don't want to take on the risk and the exposure, bring on. OK, cool. You don't have to. You know, you can go out there and create a very successful team. Again, the majority of my team, like 90% of my team right now today um, is, is, is as far as agents on my team are not getting leads and are not in a leads given model. Now it's a different split plan. Now, I started that like, so in the leads given model, you know, it's a 50, 50 split, you know, right. At least for me, that's how I'm not saying to go out there and, and necessarily do this for you. I'm just walking you through what I've done. So you have this knowledge, you know, so anything that I provided to them or provided for them was a 50, 50 split. You know, right when it came to leads, anything self-procured was a 70-30 split. 
Now, today I'm actually at an 80-20% split on the self-procured model. Now, I don't recommend that when you're starting out, right? Like I wasn't able to do that until I got, you know, I was about, I don't know, 30, 35 agents, you know, um, so it was a volume game. The more volume that you do, you know, well, that allowed me to go out there. Um, and because we operate very efficiently, very effectively, you know, our margins were really good. It allowed me that wiggle room to offer a more lucrative split to be more competitive in our market, to get more agents to want to come to us and have a higher retention. You know, but I was only able to do that at a certain volume. You know, the more volume that you do, the more, you know, that you have some wiggle room to go out there and, and, and you know, screw with this stuff. So you can run a non-leads division. Um, you can run a combination of these things. Yeah, one point in time. Now, I don't have an ISA division anymore. I dissolved that about three years ago, not because it wasn't good, not because it wasn't profitable. It was, um, but it didn't allow me to scale as fast as I wanted to scale. So I realized at that point to dissolve that division and just, you know, remove that from, but okay, I, mean, I had an ISA division, leads given division and non-leads given division. Yeah, right. So again, like you can combine, you know, these different models as well. Um, now today, I also have a team within the team division and a progressive growth model. Now this might be, you know, more advanced when you're further down the pipeline uh, as far as your, your team journey. But what I like about this model, what led to this model is, you know, early on, you know, for my first, I don't know, seven years of running my team, it was a very traditional 50-50 split on everything. Didn't matter if it was self-procured or came from me, you know, um, but I was also investing about 60 grand a month in, in leads at that point. And, you know, so like I was, you know, most of my agents, like 80, 90% of their production were from my leads and so forth. So it was, a you know, everybody won and margins were great and, you know, it's very profitable and so forth. But the, the headache I encountered, the resistance that I encountered is, my average agent was with me for 25 months and then bounced, 25 months, bounced, 25 months, bounced, you know, right? Um, you know, so so I was like, all right, man, like, I, I don't want to have this revolving door because you got to understand, like, at least if, if you don't have this progressive growth model, teams are typically a stepping stone. People are going to go, you know, jump with it to, to learn, to be mentored. But as soon as they build their book of business, they build up the repeat referral business, they figure this thing out, they figure out how to go out there and self-procure deals. You know, a lot of times they go out there and bounce, you know, um, um. So then that's when I got tired of, of that. So then that's when I started the leads given division and then the non leads given division. So then my teammates, my agents that were like, Hey man, I don't need the leads anymore, but I still like the support and the training and the guidance and the mentorship. Okay. Well then now they could go out there and build a self procured business. Um, but I could still retain and maintain them without giving them the leads. And now that was on like the 70, 30 split, you know, and again, that's evolved now today. Um, but then from there, okay. The next level was, okay. Now I started getting, you know, uh, uh, agents that started my team that now they're doing, you know, 15, you know, sometimes 15, 20 million a year, even as, you know, one agent. And now they on a team, so they have all the support there, uh, but now they're ready to start their own teams. You know, so then I was like, so then actually I know I'm losing those, you know, right. I'm like, I'm just losing. And I'm like, Hey man, I need to come up with a progressive model. That's a win-win for everybody that allows them to then grow their teams within my team. And we can, you know, support them and grow and expand together. Now, this is something newer for me. You know, I've only been doing this, this team within the team model for three years now. Um, you know, but like to give an example, I mean, I have multiple different team leaders right now inside my organization. You know, I've got four of them to be exact. Um, the smallest team inside my organization, team within the team is eight agents. The largest I have is 40 agents, right? Now, these are teams within the teams, you know, that's separate from, you know, kind of my team with the agents, you know, but those teams within the teams, you know, I'm able to mentor and provide support, provide all of that. So what am I providing to them? Well, we provide all the transaction coordination support, the listing coordination support we provide when they go out there and recruit and bring on agents. You know, we provide all the initial onboarding, all the initial training. We, you know, um, provide the systems, you know, so then our team leaders, all they have to focus on is going out there, recruiting new agents, providing opportunities for their agents and keeping their agents accountable. We provide all the support and then we provide the guidance and mentorship to those team leaders, right? So everybody wins, right? So um, um, you can have those progressive split models, you know, which I love, man. I, I want, you know, retention and, you you know, to me, you know, yeah, I'm making less money on the team leaders than I would over here, but those are people that would leave me anyways. So I, 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 you know, as long as I'm profitable and I'm making money, you know, I'd rather have a win-win platform, a win-win program that we can all win together versus just lose them all together, not being able to, you know, uh, 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 you know, share in, in all that success and, and not be able to support them. All right. So get lots of different models, 
you know, again, your model is just going to be what is the model I'm going to use to go out there and play the real estate game. That's all that this is. So make sure that you're just, and again, I'm just kind of planting seeds to get your wheels turning. You know, to, I mean, you can have a lot of different models, other models than what we talked about here today. These are just kind of some of the most common, you know, ones that, that I see, you know, out there in different ways. And again, it could be a combination of all of, you know, it can be a combination of all of these, you know, right. Um, um, but it just gets, gets those wheels turning and put some thought into that. All right, now let's talk about splits and comp plans. And I know we're going long here. I'm almost done. So we'll start wrapping up here shortly. Um, you know, the last two steps here, splits and comp plans. And we're going to talk about how, you know, how to continue to go out there and grow and scale it you know, um, on a continued path. So these won't take as long as what we just ran through and talked about. So when it comes to splits and commission plans, now, what I recommend here is to reverse engineer this. The mistake that you that most make is they go out there and hear, oh, well, Josh, here's your splits. Here's these other mega agents. Here's the top of the top in the industry. Maybe they're listening to me or hear me or they're listening to other people having this, this podcast here, you know, or the top, you know, maybe it's a top agent in their market or their office. And then they go out there and try to duplicate and clone their splits. Now, I'm not saying like I'm all about R&D, rip off and duplicate. But you got to be careful with this, right? You got to reverse engineer the process. You got to go out there and, and peel back the onion layers, you know, when it comes to this. All right. So here's an example. When I had my ISA division, all right, my ISA, I didn't pay him a salary, didn't pay him hourly, didn't pay, they just got a 20% of the gross commission, right? So ISA got 20% of the gross commission. My agents got 50% of the gross commission. So that left me over 30%. Now, if you went out there and, and started deploying and ran that model, you probably would go broke. Right. Um, um, you know, with those splits. So why did it? So that would be the surface level. Then we got to get deep. We go, see, you know, we, we dive down into there to see how this worked. How did I make it where and structure behind the scenes where it was so profitable? Yeah. You know, right. OK. Number one, um, uh, my um, agents were mandated to go out there and charge a 495 transaction fee to every single buyer and seller client. And if they couldn't collect that and couldn't uh, get that fee, then it came out of the agent split. Um, that 495 came 100% to me. That wasn't split with the agents. So that 495 was intentional and strategic of that fee because that covered all my admin and all my system and equipment costs, right? So I offset and zero base my admin, my um, uh, in my hard you know system and and overall expenses. So then from there, the next thing, I, the only other thing I had expenses on were leads. So then I partnered with you know strategic great vendor partners that covered all my lead costs. So all my leads were paid for, which is about $15,000 a month in that division. You know, all my staff, equipment, all of that was paid for the transaction. So that 30% of the commission that got paid to me as the team leader was 100% pure net profit, right? So that's, that's just an example of you got to peel back the onion layers. You know, a lot of teams or a lot of bigger teams, a lot of, you know, bigger brokerages, you know, um, they have other ancillaries, they have other revenue centers, you know, they have, so just making sure that you are you're really dissecting this and deciphering this and breaking this down. And also understand that your comp plans and your structures are going to be dependent on the value that you give to your agents. You know, so if I'm if I'm okay, let's just say I'm you know offering, okay, I got office space and I, I allow my agents to have these you know great locations office space to, to come in and work at and be a part of. Um, then from there I offer you know transaction coordinators, listing coordinators, I'm paying for all of the equipment, all of the systems, I'm you know paying for leads, I'm paying for an ISA, you know, I'm paying for all of those things, right? Um, well, that's that's a and plus in addition to coaching, training, mentorship, you know, and so forth. Okay, well, like I can get away with you know uh, allow my agents to only collect thirty percent or forty percent of the commissions, where maybe I'm getting seventy or or sixty percent of those commissions, you know, because the, I'm offering a lot more value. But then also at the same time, I'm taking on a lot more expenses, a lot more exposure, a lot more risk with those. So you got to really break down based on the model that you want to create. And, and what do you want to offer your agents? And, and, and what is that, that model that you want to run? What do you want to offer? What are those hard expenses going to be? Like, you got to make sure that you are profitable with this. So you got to be able to break this down. Okay. Well, if I'm only, if I'm collecting 50%, what are my margins then? You know, if I'm collecting 60% and what mistake that a lot of team leaders make is usually, especially in the beginning stages, you know, until you get to out of 20 agents or so forth, like where, where, you know, you're able to, to start backing out of your own production. Um, and where your your agents are bringing in, you know, a, a majority of the revenue into the to the team until you get to that point, you know, you as the agent or you as the team leader are probably going to be a big majority of the production of that organization. Well, you got to pretend that your income doesn't exist. 
you know, and I recommend that you run two different PLs because you got your job, your production, then you got the business. Like run two separate PLs and run these models off of pretending your production doesn't exist. Cause what so many do is they start setting up their split structures where essentially they're just breaking even off of their their agents. So then yeah, now now your all your your commissions are pure profit, but now they're reliant on that. You know, so you got to really break this stuff down, reverse engineer this. So be smart, be intelligent when it comes to your comp structures. Something I spend a lot of time with when it comes to my team leader and broker owner coaching clients and those that I mentor and coach, um, um, because we got to make sure that we get this right. You know, right. So make sure that you do your due diligence on that. All right. So now lastly, let's talk about how to go out there and continue to grow and scale. So there's two primary things that allow you to go out there and grow and scale. And then I want to talk to you also about an important thing that you need to do, especially in those infancy stages as a team leader. Otherwise, it's, it's one of the biggest traps and the biggest pain points that I see get into. But the first thing is we're going to talk about the two things that allow you to go out there and scale, systems and people. Now, I would argue that systems are more important than people. And the reason why I say that, not that people aren't extremely important, but again, it doesn't matter how great people are. If you don't have great systems for them to plug into and great processes that live inside those systems, you know, they're not, they can't go out there and show you their greatness. So you've got to make sure, okay, everything that's done more than once inside your business, you have a documented process for that. And that process lives inside a system. Why processes is the step-by-step -step actions that you take to go out there and get the desired result that you are looking to go out there and get, right? You take that out of your head, you put it onto paper. Um, that those are the processes, put those processes inside a system. So then that way your admin, your agents, everybody is able to plug into a system and you eliminate that guesswork. There should be, you, you need to get to a point where you're so system-based where there's no guesswork in your business. Like any agent on my team, if they are not succeeding, they can never sit there and say, oh, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, didn't uh, succeed because Josh didn't you know, provide me the support and the training and the help, right? Like they, they can only admit to themselves if they're, if they're you know, man or woman enough to do so, that the reason that they failed is because they chose to not put in the work. You know, so like everything is documented, everything is broken down, every aspect, whether it be, you know, lead gen, lead follow-up, you know, contract. I mean, every, like there's an aspect of my business that isn't broken down and documented in a process and a system. Like to the point, even like with leads that come in our CRM, you know, when those tasks pop up, I, tell, I have it displayed on there and built out where it tells my agents, hey, if they answer the phone, you say this. If they don't answer the phone, here's the voicemail to say. Like, okay, like, let me all that guesswork. So as well, I, I knew I needed this. I just didn't know how to do it. Now, like, okay, here's an example. Okay, on our, our listing manual, walks them through, okay, like when you're following up with these leads, here's the exact, you know, scripts, whatever to say, you know, when you're setting that appointment, here's the exact appointment setting script, here's the exact questions that you ask to gather all the information that you need to go out there and set the appointment. Again, here's the, uh, you know, appointment setting script. Okay, boom, now that you set the appointment, here's the exact step-by-step -step follow protocol. Here's the second hand up the phone, here's the email that you send off. Here's the text message. Here's exactly step-by-step -step how you confirm that appointment, exactly what you say. Here's exactly step-by-step -step how you prepare for that listing presentation. Okay, well, then you pull up the property 15 minutes early. You do this visualization exercise. At that point, then you should have these things in your hand or these things in a briefcase. You knock on that door 10 minutes early when that seller answers the door. You look in at the eyes, you reach out your hand, you shake your hand, you say this. Then you do this. Then you do this. Here's exactly step by step how you do the tour. Here's exact, like everything is documented in our manuals, in our processes, step by step that we deliver to our staff, to our agents. So there is no, again, that we eliminate all of that guesswork. You know, right. And then boom, you're plugging your people into those systems. You know, right. So again, you need to have the systems and processes in place and they're always evolving. They don't need to be perfect, but they, you know, always need to be evolving and are always building those out. And it's part of what my coaching program is, Mastery Bootcamp Coaching Program. Inside there, I just give you all of my systems, all of my processes, all of my documents editable format so you can just copy plug play um in that way you know like you can instead of you know waiting 17 years like i you know building this stuff out like you're able to take what i you know took me seven years to build out and just boom immediately adopt it and plug and play in your business and tweak it and edit it how you want to tweak it and edit it um, um but you know maybe you don't want to do that maybe you don't want to rip off and duplicate and go out there and you know steal my business and what's proven you want to figure all this stuff out in your own okay fine that's cool but you got to do it like you got to get this stuff in place right then from there you got to make sure then that you have the ability to go out there and hire talented people um <clears throat> You know, one of the most costly mistakes for you inside your business is, uh, uh, you know, hiring the wrong people. So you need to go out there just like you mastered your listing presentation or buyer presentation or lead generation opportunities and so forth. You need to master your skill set on hiring people, right? Like, and in, 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 in look, I'm not saying when you master it that you're not going to get it wrong. Just like, okay, mate, like I can sit there and honestly say that I've mastered my listing presentation and buyer consultation. Does it mean I have a 100% close rate of every single one? No. 
you know, right? Like, you know, there's going to be reasons as to, you know, so, you know, sometimes once in a while, like you may, you may accidentally get a, a you know, hire the wrong person because people can go out there and trick you in the interview or whatever, you know, um, um, you know, it could happen. Yeah, right. Um, it's been a long time since it's happened to me. Um, um, and I went through a lot of pain on this, man. I realized that I had to really dial this process in, you know, with admin, with agent recruiting, agent hiring, and especially with admin and then building out your leadership team and so forth. You know, um, um, so I've spent a tremendous amount of time going out there mastering that process, you know, how to go out there and write the ads. You know, like I have five tests in Easter egg tests within that ad before we actually even get to the interview process. Now, they're not aware that there's five tests in there, but it's like, okay, here's all these little tests before we even get to the interview process. So then I can sort out 300 applicants down to just one because only one out of usually, you know, but usually it's about one out of 100. So it's about 1% that'll pass those initial tests. You know, so then from there, I've got with admin, I got my two-step interview process. First one is a culture interview. Second one is a skill set interview. Then from there, we have the, you know, a test. You know, if they make it through all of those, well, then they still have a final proficiency test that we need to put them through to make sure that they are the right person for this role, for this responsibilities, you know, right? Like you got to, you got to master this stuff. You got to dial this stuff in. So, you know, as you're starting to lead, you know, like one of the skill sets that you got to master is how to go out there and hire and train agents. And I know I'm talking a lot about my coaching program here, you know, today, but if this is something that you want to go out there and master, you know, I've got all of this inside my coaching program, you know, one dedicated section to all of this when it comes to admin, one to just uh, uh, real estate agents and that. So about 10 hours of, of training and mentorship and coaching on, on both aspects, um, you know, and so forth with those things. So um, making sure that you're mastering that. So systems and people. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is scaling by playing red light, green light, and uh, red light, green, what I call red light, green light time allocation, right? So one of the biggest traps and one of the biggest mistakes I see Newer team leaders making. When I say newer team leaders, you know, I, I'm not talking about time frame. I'm talking about those that are maybe, you know, um, uh, below 10 agents, you know, right? Like, or, or maybe even below 20 agents, you know, um, it, it, especially in those beginning stages, man. Let, let's just say you have five agents. Um, and, and you started your team a year ago and now or six months ago and, and you've you know got four or five agents now inside your team. Here is the mistake that most make is okay, as a team leader at that state you are probably, let's just say 80% of the revenue coming in for your overall business. Your agents are probably 20%. Like, look, your agents aren't going to be you. You know, I hear team leaders all the time like, oh, if I could just, you know, clone myself. I'm like, dude, if you cloned yourself, you'd be cloning your competition. You are a team, team leader. You are a rainmaker for a reason. If you, if you hired yourself, they would go out there and start their break off and start their own team and become your competition. You know, right? Like you are the leader for a reason. You know, you can't expect your agents to go out there and, and uh, operate in the same way that you do, close as many deals as you do. You know, it's like one of my coaching clients who operates and runs a big brokerage. I mean, she also sells 170 homes a year by herself, plus operates a brokerage of, of about 50 or 60 agents down at this point. You know, right? Like, okay, like her cloning, uh, she's a freak of nature. Yeah, right. But there's a reason why she is who she is and does what she does. And yeah, you know, I mean, she's got a lot of high producing agents, you know, but they're not doing 170 units a year. Like, okay, for her to go out there and clone herself, like, you know, it, it, the probability that's going to be, you know, low. I mean, you're, you're the leader, you, you know, for, for a reason inside the organization. So get that and understand that. Okay. So, okay. You got like 80% of, of, of all the revenue, the revenue that's coming into the business that says from your revenue, 20% is coming in from your agents. Well, here's the mistake in the trap that I see is that next thing you know, as a team leader, 80% of your time gets allocated to training and supporting and mentoring your agents and now recruiting new agents and so forth. So then all of a sudden, 80% of your time is devoted to what's bringing you 20% of income. And then all of a sudden your production falls off the cliff and now you're fucked, right? It's like now, now maybe you can't even make payroll. Like right now you're in a very tough, hard spot. And this is, you know, a, a place where a lot of team leaders end up reaching out to me of like, hey, what do I do here? Right. So this is where it, come, it comes in this red light, green light time allocation. You got to understand this. You got to deploy this. And especially not just especially, but also this is the continued path that, to follow and the strategy to follow if you want to exit from production. Right. So <clears throat> what this means is you're playing red light, green light, and you're allocating your time based on the percentage of revenue that's coming in your business. So let's just say in that case, OK, Team leader, 80%, agents are 20%. So 80% then of that team leader's time, focus and energy is going to be allocated to their own production because that's 80% of the revenue. Now, 20% of their time is going to be allocated to their agents, supporting their agents, training their agents, being there for their agents and recruiting new agents, right? Um, because that's 20% of the business revenue. Now, the key here is to be so effective and efficient through the right systems and so forth with that, the time, that 20% time that you give to your agents, well, then boom, that bumps it to 30%. 
you know, right? So then now, okay, you can bump your time allocation down to your own production at 70%. And now you can give 30% to your agents. And then same thing here. Now this bumps up to 40%. Now you can drop your time allocation down to 60% for your production. Now you got 40% to your agents and not just your agents and supporting your agents. Look, you always got to be recruiting. Like agents are going to leave. Right. So you got to just just like on the buy and sell side, it's like you like eventually your pipeline dries up. All those deals close like you got to always be going out there and, and you know, recruit, you're either recruiting buyers, recruiting sellers, recruiting agents or eventually recruiting your leadership team to do those things for you. You're always recruiting regardless. Right. Um, so you're playing that red light, green light. And then eventually, if you want to take it all the way to the point where, you know, OK, now that allows you to get out of production where you get enough revenue coming in. And when you're getting out of production, make sure that you know your number. You know, so um, and what, let's just say, okay, as an example, let's just say, okay, you need the business paying you twenty thousand dollars a month salary, um, um, uh, for you to allocate one hundred percent of your time to recruiting agents, coaching agents, being there to support your agents, and that would then make sense for you to exit from production. And maybe you're taking a big step back. Maybe you're typically making more than that with commissions, but sometimes you got to take a step back to move forward. So maybe that's your number. Okay, so it, you know, you got to make sure that you that that amount of revenue, um, uh, that you have. Your agent's revenue, not just covering your your current business expenses, but also is can afford that twenty thousand dollar monthly salary as an example. And I personally want to see four straight months of consistent tracked, you know, a uh, uh, data and four consistent months of that income. You know, so then I know it's a trend. It can it's measurable. It's predictable. It can be duplicatable. You know, before I want to you know make that move of exiting out of production myself in that scenario. You know, but that red light, green light time allocation becomes essential to go out there and follow as far as growing, scaling your team, and then also you can continue following that you know strategy and path if you want to exit from production. All right, so I know that this was a long one here today, but again, I wanted to do really a, a kind of a high level breakdown, deep dive into just important shit that you need to make sure that you nail, get right, and understand and know when it comes to building, starting, growing, and continuing to grow and scale a successful real estate business. So hopefully you found this helpful. Again, if you haven't already, go check out GSD Mode. Highly recommend it. Go check out my coaching program, gsdmode.com forward slash coaching. If you are looking uh, for a coach, for a mentor to help you take your business to the next level, again, there's not a, a more effective or better program out there. And I'm not just saying that it's the best for the price. It's hands down the best. I don't care if you're paying $80,000 a year for coaching for a platform. This is the best coaching platform. It's just going to save you $78,000 a year. Um, uh, so, you know, most effective, far superior, but also in addition to that, just happens to also be the most affordable. If you're looking for that, again, gsdmode.com forward slash coaching. Go learn more about it. All right, guys, truly appreciate being here. Keep kicking ass and I'll talk to you next time. Peace.